morning, everybody. We're going to get started. So um, there's still seats, plenty of seats. Come on in. It's a bit of a hike to get here, but um, we keep everybody very fit at BioCycle conferences. So as you uh, uh, go from room to room as we go into breakout sessions. Um, I'm Nora Goldstein, editor of BioCycle magazine. And on behalf of uh, BioCycle uh, and our staff in the Goldstein family, uh, we welcome you to BioCycle East Coast uh, Conference 2014 uh, here in the Baltimore region. Uh, it's, uh, we are so honored. Uh, we've we've uh, just had a fabulous turnout. We have uh, wonderful sponsors. And I just want to recognize our sponsors before I get into just a few little housekeeping things. Uh, we have uh, two platinum sponsors. The first is Quasar Energy Group, and Quasar um, has uh, partners and collaborators as participants under their sponsorship. So we'd also like to recognize Forest City Enterprises, the Alpha Group, Grind to Energy, Rockwell Automation, Rexel, and Tank Connection. Our other double platinum sponsors, the U.S. Composting Council, BioCycle is the official magazine of the U.S. Composting Council. Also, uh, thank you to U.S. EPA AgStar, CCI Bioenergy Inc., McGill Environmental Systems, ENR Sales, Gore Cover, Caterpillar, Novamont North America, U.S. EPA Region 3, Coker Composting and Consulting, the Biodegradable Products Institute, Unison Solutions, Institute for Local Self-Reliance, the Maryland Department of the Environment, the Compost Council of Canada, and the American Biogas Council. So thank you to our sponsors for uh, <laughs> supporting us here. I just wanted to go over a, just a very brief uh, logistics uh, breakfast. The Continental Breakfast, as you just saw, the lunch and the breaks are all in the, in the um, the grand ballroom, and there's also a setup in the uh, the supplementary cameo lobby room, um, and the ice cream social this afternoon. The ice cream being served is from Kilby Creamery, which is on our site tour two site tour two on Thursday, and the composting services to Turf Valley are provided by Veteran Compost. Both Bill Kilby and Justin Garrity with Veteran Compost are going to be speaking. Uh, actually today, this afternoon. So thank you to them. Uh, this evening from 6.15 to 7.30, we're doing a reception, uh, compliments of BioCycle and a silent auction. Uh, and just uh, follow the agenda program that, that, that's in your, follow the agenda that's in your program, uh, those track one, two, three, four. And the track one will be here. Tracks two and three are basically the other side of the hotel. So go out past the register, you know, where the registration desk is, and just start walking in the other direction. We have signs up. Track two and three are in Waterford, uh, the Waterford rooms, and four is Oakdale is just right. You make a right right after the um, hotel registration desk. Uh, tour buses for those of you joining us for the tour are at 7:40. Uh, we're boarding at 7:45 a.m. The buses will be right out in the driveway uh, outside the hotel lobby. And um, just want to, uh, before we get started, just want to welcome all of our attendees and participants here today. We have about 35 states represented, plus the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, and uh, representatives from nine countries, including we have a speaker from South Africa. So we've really brought together a very diverse and uh, exciting group of people. Take advantage and network uh, and enjoy your, your time here at BioCycle East Coast Conference. At this time, I would like to introduce the regional administrator for the US EPA Mid-Atlantic region, Mr. Sean Garvin. Sean's responsibilities include administering federal programs governing air and water pollution, industrial discharges, the prote protection of streams, lakes, and bays, and the protection of public health and communities in Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. Let's welcome Mr. Sean Garvin. Thank you very much, Nora. It really is a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I want to recognize our, our panel guests here. 
Chris Cano of Gainesville Compost, Hannah Clark of Lenine Solutions, and Michael Lemon of Biogas Researches. Uh, also, I want to recognize um, Secretary Bob Summers uh, from the Maryland Department of Environment, who will be joining us shortly, uh, but has a command performance outside um, for a few minutes. Um, I'm really proud that EPA can be a co-sponsor of this Cutting Edge Conference, and I appreciate this opportunity to offer remarks because BioCycle generates such positive energy around, or re around organic recycling. BioCycle is an established leader in this industry, and you are a valued partner. EPA appreciates the opportunity to interact with BioCycle on sharing information about the organics recycling industry, new and promising technology, best practices, and we thank you for your support of our mutual goal of increasing the rate of organics recycling. Organics recycling is a top priority for EPA in supporting the agency's strategic sustainability goals. While at first glance, organics recycling may seem like just a waste management issue, and really, it's so much more. Many of these programs and projects highlighted at this conference focus on key waste management topics like reducing methane emission, producing renewable energy, nutrient management, and divert, diverting organics away from landfills, which is very much a story that needs to be told. EPA sustainable materials management programs helps to conserve resources, reduce waste, slow climate change, and minimize the environmental impact of the materials we use. It focuses on the responsible recycling of electronics, encourages federal agencies to lead by example by reducing federal government's impact, and through the Food Recovery Challenge, seeks to reduce as much food waste as possible from landfills. As for diverting food waste from landfills, in order for these kinds of diversion programs to succeed, we need a robust organics recycling infrastructure. Many of EPA's efforts in organics diversion are designed to support the increase in infrastructure and or organic recycling, both regionally and nationally. But that's not the job we do by ourselves. I believe in all of our best interests to become broader advocates for organic recycling infrastructure. As I'm sure this group knows, food is the largest component of the municipal solid waste stream going to our landfills. It's worth noting that recent data shows that food waste disposal is decreasing. The volume of food disposed dropped from 35 million tons in 2011 to 34.7 million tons in 2012, which equates to a 300,000 more tons diverted. While changing the way people think about food can be challenging, it is incumbent upon all of us here, as well as our friends and colleagues, to keep pushing the emerging concept that food be considered a commodity and not just a waste. Through composting or anaerobic digestion, what once was considered a waste can be made into a product that will be used to improve our health of our soils and safely provide nutrients to our croplands. Among the numerous benefits that will be explored in detail at this conference, I'd like to highlight two that directly relate to anaerobic digestion and EPA's top priorities. First, reducing methane emissions helps mitigate global climate change. And second, more efficient nutrient management directly contributes to restoring the magnificence of the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem, among other water bodies. Last March, EPA released a key component called for in the President's Climate Action Plan, a strategy to reduce methane emissions, which includes exploring opportunities to expand the use of anaerobic digestion systems to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by capturing and combusting met methane. Since anaerobic digestion systems can reduce greenhouse gases emissions by capturing and combusting methane, EPA is actively exploring opportunities for expanding the application as part of the strategic, st sorry, the strategy for addressing climate change. Last August, the administration released the Biogas Opportunities Roadmap, a collaborative effort between EPA, DOE, and USDA outlining voluntary actions supporting the expansion of the American biogas industry and enhancing biogas potentials in the U.S. EPA is committed to actively working with our federal, regional, and state counterparts to overcome barriers to the biogas industry. 
Also, you will hear quite a bit at this conference about the Chesapeake Bay. I believe this is, this is an entire track devoted to nutrient management in the Chesapeake Bay, and rightfully so. As you know, there are numerous farms in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. EPA and our partners are committed to helping farmers implement nutrient management strategies that will improve water quality throughout the watershed. While anaerobic digestion won't solve all the nutrient management issues in the Bay watershed and elsewhere, it does provide farmers with additional options to assist with the challenges of managing manure properly and preventing runoff. Before wrapping up, I do want to recognize Maryland for their significant strides last year in revamping their composting regulations. EPA applauds Maryland's efforts toward performance-based, common sense, environmentally sound requirements for composting facilities, which will raise the vis visibility of composting in Maryland and hopefully have a positive effect on efforts to increase composting rates in surran surrounding states. While this conference will explore many exciting possibilities and point to several successes for sustainable organic materials management, I would like to offer one last point. I believe it's essential to keep in mind that building the infrastructure for composting and other sustainable technologies include laying the groundwork for necessary public support that are also integral for their acceptability and success. Those of us in the organics recycling movement have become very adept at talking to each other about these things, which while necessary may not be sufficient to build broader culture that fully embraces sustainable organics management. A culture of ac expertise can sometimes hamper our ability to achieve the very environmental, economic, and public health benefits that we are striving for if we are not sufficiently inclusive in targeting our message through a broader audience. While I know I'm preaching to the choir, I'd like to close by encouraging all of us to think about opportunities to spend more time talking publicly about these technologies in everyday language that can be easily understood. This will go a long way in helping all of us achieve our goals of organics recycling. So with that in mind, I wish you all an enjoyable and productive conference. Thank you. with me one minute here. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Sean, for the, those welcoming remarks. Um, I just wanted to take a minute before we go into our next uh, series of, of presenters here to explain the Jerome Goldstein Scholarship Fund for eco entrepreneuring. Uh, Jerry Goldstein, uh, my father, started BioCycle as compost science in 1960 and was a real visionary in uh, his really seeing the benefit of recycling organics uh, back to soils to create energy, the whole nine yards. Um, when he passed away, we created the Jerome Goldstein Scholarship Fund for Eco-Entrepreneuring at the Rutgers Eco Complex, which is in Bordentown, New Jersey. It's part of Rutgers University. And the first students who uh, uh, received funding, uh, there were four in, uh, three interns this summer uh, who received uh, the first round of funding to support their research. And uh, we just thought, because we're entering into our, our millennial scene here, uh, both uh, two of the three are with us today, and I just wanted to take an opportunity to recognize them and introduce them. We have Alec Roth right over there. <laughs> and and Selene, um, I didn't see you before I saw Altia. Okay, excellent, thank you. 
And Bonnie Zhang is the, uh, the third recipient. She's in a, a PhD program. Uh, we had this wonderful opportunity for, to go to the Rutgers Eco Complex and they presented their research. Uh, they do have posters with them uh, today that are going to be out near our registration desk. So I encourage you to look at those. Um, this is a fun, this is why we're doing the auction this evening to uh, silent auction. So there's really fun things people donated and, and uh, very creative. So we encourage you to bid early and often. Thank you. I just wanted to... Uh, Biocycles Mac users, and so we're always a little bit rusty in our, uh, our capabilities here. We had, uh, I think, it in, uh, really been inspired not just but, you know for people we encounter uh, at you know for this conference, but throughout our conferences and articles we do on the the vision, the energy, the excitement, the creativity, the innovation of young professionals entering. Uh, the field that are really going to carry the torch going forward. Um, I'm just curious for a show of hands, how many millennials, how many are millennials in this room? That would, raise them high so we can see. Excellent, excellent. Well, this is great. We want you to continue to be inspired. So we, um, and even if you're not, you can raise your hand. Um, <laughs> or maybe you did that. I just can't see that far. Uh, um, so um, we're, um, put together this panel of, of, and I wouldn't, somebody sort of chastised me for calling a millennial, or yeah, millennials instead of young professionals, and I said, well, you just can't, it doesn't roll off your tongue, you know, to, to introduce these uh, speakers. I'm just looking for the, uh, the uh, theme here. Uh, millennials on the move in climate resiliency. Did you say run young professionals on the move? It just doesn't roll off your tongue. So I, I went with millennials and, um, so today we have with us uh, three, uh, and we selected, uh, and I apologize, I'm flipping around in my program here, let me just get my bearings, here we go. Uh, we have uh, Chris Kano with Gainesville Compost, representing the composting sector of organics recycling, Michael Lemon with Biogas Researchers, representing the anaerobic digestion and biogas, and Hannah Clark of Linnaean Solutions, who represents the potential of the organics recycling technology systems and innovation within the scale of sustainability in communities, uh, neighborhoods. So she's going to sort of weave the threads together. So uh, Chris Kano is compost experience officer at Gainesville Compost. They're a pedal powered community compost network founded in Gainesville in 2011. Um, Michael Lemon is Vice President of Biogas Researchers, a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., highlighting opportunities in the production and consumption of biogas. And Hannah Clark is Project Manager at Linnaean Solutions in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and is working on development and implementation of district scale sustainability initiatives. So with that, I'm going to let Chris get started. They're each going to take about 10, 12 minutes to describe what they're doing and uh, Will be fun. Thanks. <laughs> Still oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my from friends. Uh, I'm from Florida. But, um, my name is Chris Cano uh, from Gainesville, Florida. Uh, compost is rich in metaphors for life and community. Who could believe that the colonies of organisms? in the compost pile could have so much to do with our own relationships and personal connections. Uh, when I first started uh, hauling food waste by bike, uh, it was in the midst of my own life decomposition of sorts. Um, I graduated in 2010 from the University of Florida with an English major which basically means you're on your own. <laughs> um, 
And um, I, I had started a, a, my own kind of entrepreneurial venture um, writing on a website I created about the Apple iPhone, a technology website. And while I was earning uh, my own income from it, uh, I felt uh, I began to feel after graduated, graduating uh, disconnected from my community. And it was at that time that I began uh, learning to grow my own food. So in a small rented property outside, uh, just outside of near the university, I, uh, with my, along with my roommates, took an interest in urban agriculture, and with that, uh, in recycling our kitchen waste and turning it into fuel for that garden. And the, the uh, project really uh, inspired me. I, let me just break here. I, I have kind of a, no specific order. It's just kind of a cycle of pictures. Um, so uh, in, in, in learning to grow my own food, uh, I, I became really inspired by the power of urban agriculture. Uh, I would often have friends over for dinner. We would eat food that we had grown in our own backyard. And uh, we would end the night uh, over a glass of wine in the backyard just marveling at how uh, beautiful and amazing it was um, that we could do this ourselves, um, that we were reconnecting with our own food. And uh, the, the family of organisms <laughs> that began in that small compost pile in 2010, uh, it persists today, three years later, um, throughout a network of community composting sites that we've begin, begun to establish in Gainesville. Uh, our program is a pedal-powered community composting network. We develop our own bicycle trailers and collect kitchen waste, uh, divert it from the landfill towards a growing network of partner sites uh, throughout our city, which are benefiting from uh, some of this, uh, the compost that we produce, um, and which are producing a, a product called soil food, which is available to local gardeners uh, throughout retail spots, uh, markets, and restaurants. Um, the idea to pick up food waste by bike uh, in 2011 was crazy, uh, seemed crazy. Um, and, and today, um, it's, it's a model that uh, people are beginning to adopt at the community scale. Um, when I once sat at a, a city meeting uh, with various industry professionals uh, discussing the issues of food waste and composting. Um, a local uh, wood waste composting professional uh, chimed in at the meeting and, and he admitted that, this was uh, about in 2013, and he admitted that when he first saw what I was doing, he thought it was crazy, but uh, as he'd seen the our network of satellite network of restaurants, uh, residents, and composting areas grow, uh, it began to dawn on him that it made a lot of sense. And so the idea, um, as it turns out, uh, to move large vehicles from point to point to point to collect what's small uh, volumes distributed widely is very challenging. And the bicycle, uh, beyond the mission of uh, sustainability, the bicycle offers uh, logistical benefits to accomplishing this. And this is what we're beginning to prove in Gainesville. Um, since we began our, our initiative, um, I've had the privilege to come to events uh, such as this and uh, other conferences. And it's really a real, a real honor to stand in front of uh, a crowd in, of industry professionals 
um, and, and to speak about um, doing this crazy thing on a bike. Um, after, after presenting at the U.S. Composting Council conference in January of 2014, uh, I met Nora and uh, BioCycle, and we were featured in, a, in an issue of BioCycle magazine, um, which described uh, the new entrepreneurial approaches that uh, people throughout the country were um, were using to address food waste, and two of those initiatives uh, were bicycle powered. Um, Since we, uh, since we received this coverage, we've uh, met people, uh, met, met a lot of people that have taken an interest in our model. Uh, most recently, we shipped three bicycle trailers to Carter's Compost in Michigan, uh, which uh, was also featured in that biocycle issue. And we've begun to manufacture uh, trailers and systems that other communities can benefit from to accomplish the goals of community composting. Um, we've shipped trailers to Savannah, Georgia, uh, to Orlando, Florida, Michigan, and uh, upcoming uh, New York City trailer for community composting. And so it all, it all comes back to, uh, to food. And what, what we're creating is uh, a source of potential for people to turn a, a resource that would otherwise be wasted into uh, something of benefit for the very communities that created it. And the, the uh, mission of community composting is tied for me closely to the mission of social entrepreneurship. And I believe that our generation uh, is beginning to accomplish, uh, to address problems um, in creative ways that are developing new models for, um, for the economy. And um, for me, this is a, a really inspiring um, movement that I, I see happening in our uh, community. Uh, la two, two weeks ago, we uh, accomplished a, uh, a year-long dream of hauling a live band on a bicycle trailer <laughs> in, in the homecoming parade uh, outside the University of Florida. It's about a, over a thousand pounds hauled by one bicycle. And uh, that day, uh, it, this all really came together for me. Um, the celebration of, uh, of what we were doing. So um, to be here to be here and presenting to you all and to see um, how uh, there's really a, this organic uh, growth in um, solving the, the, the mission that we all share um, in creative community ways and to see how that's embraced by the wider industry um, to me is really exciting. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, Michael Lemon with Biogas Researchers is going to to uh, present their their creative and innovative entrepreneurial idea. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nora. Hello, my name is Michael. Can you hear me all right? Hello, my name is Michael Lemon, and I am Vice President and Co-Founder of Biogas Researchers. We're a nonprofit based in our nation's capital, and our mission is to build the biogas economy on our organic waste. We do this by identifying opportunities afforded by the production and consumption of biogas. We are at a remarkable moment in time. The actions we take in the near future will define the sustainability and, more importantly, the quality of life for generations to come. Like the decision we made to become a car culture in the 1950s and how that led us down the road of urban sprawl, 
We must think through the decisions made today because they will shape our cities of tomorrow. I'm humbled to be speaking to an industry that I believe will be the backbone of sustainable infrastructure in the next few decades. As the title of this panel suggests, I'm a millennial. I'm old enough to remember the frustrations of dial-up internet. <laughs> I remember reaching the six billion mark. And I remember China for its rickshaws and sea of bicycles rather than the pollution and congestion it's known for today. I think millennials were asked to present at this conference because we can help foster the broader transition towards sustainability. Our time has come. So it's appropriate that I start out by sharing a view of the future from the perspective of, thir of a 13-year-old, my cousin Victoria. She's studying renewable energy and fossil fuels in middle school. And when I asked her thoughts on the matter, she said that we were like children in a candy shop, and eventually we were gonna get a stomachache. That's a blunt but very true assessment. The world's population is projected to grow from the 7.2 billion, pardon me, the 7.2 billion it is today to 9.6 by 2050. Much of this growth will take place in developing countries, the poorer countries of the world, notwithstanding that they actually have the majority of our population. The potential of these countries can be seen by the rapid rise of China and India questionably whether or not that growth is sustainable in the long run. 25 years from now, these once impoverished nations will make up two-thirds of our global economy. That's triple what it was when I was born. That's profound and remarkable change in the global economy. Our world needs to quickly find solutions in regards to how to responsibly manage that growth. I have a vision for how we can work to change our future so we don't end up with many Chinas and Indias and megacities that are simply not sustainable. But let's first look closely at the three main drivers that this growth requires of us. Our energy, our food and water, and our infrastructure, our cities where we live. What's not often discussed is that these three major drivers are interconnected. And if we manage policies around energy, our food and water, and infrastructure individually, we're going in the wrong direction. We will create a world void of clean water and healthy food and replace it with one riddled with waste, pollution, congestion, environmental destruction, and all the things that are emblematic of our many sprawling cities around the world today. This first driver is energy. Energy use over the past 25 years has increased by 50%. 80% of that is based off of coal. Over the next two decades, we'll see the demand for energy fueled by our smartphones and many computers to rise another 40%. That is a huge problem. The second global driver is our food and our water. And where will that come from? To feed our growing population, it's estimated that we'll need another Brazil's worth of arable land. Our food is in inexplicably tied to oil at this point. Fossil fuels are found in our fertilizer, in our pesticides, in our packaging, and therefore in our food itself. In fact, it's estimated that over 95% of the food that we eat travels over a thousand miles to meet our plate. This too is not sustainable. Two billion people don't have access to basic sanitation and another billion lack access to clean, drinkable water. 2.2 million people die each day from consuming contaminated water. That's 9,500 per day. We must find solutions now. The final driver is our infrastructure, our cities. 50% of the world's population right now live in urban areas. 
and that's going to increase to 70% by 2050. That's profound change. For the first time ever, just this year, more of the world's population lives in cities than in rural areas. But our cities aren't built with environmentally sustainable solutions in mind, and instead they've become siphons for our world's natural resources. These three drivers, food, water, energy, and our cities, and our infrastructure, will define the ability for our society and planet to provide for our growing population. So let's look at how a biogas economy transforms these problems into advantages moving forward, which is one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be here today. Now, I know all of you are familiar with biogas and anaerobic digestion, and I wanted to make sure that we view them in the same way, and that is that they are the stomach of our future community, of our cities, and our planet. Linking our gr growing population and the organic waste that comes with it to renewable energy and sustainable food production while providing a sustainable infrastructure that we can base all of the above energy strategies off of. That's how the biogas economy, I believe, will become the backbone of this sustainable infrastructure going forward. When we think of it this way, a biogas economy turns all of these problems, our growing population and the organic waste that comes with it, our energy consumption, our need for food and water, into part of the solution. We have to invest most or both efficiently and intelligently in our cities, strengthening the core of our cities and the infrastructure that can bring benefits in public transportation, recycling, composting, activities that bring our communities together. A great example of which is Chris in Gainesville Compost. The first chapter in biogas researchers over the past eight months has been focused on how people will move around these sprawling cities of today and the future, transportation. Our Clean City Cabs project would put the benefits of renewable biogas in a citywide fleet, the taxi cab. My other co-founder will be presenting on this tomorrow, and I hope you'll take a listen. The idea is to move us closer to carbon negative transportation within our cities while improving air quality and the livability of our cities while lowering the cost of not owning a car. Washington, D.C. is an example of a city taking steps in the right direction. Sustainable D.C. and their Green Roofs movement. D.C. Water's investment in the nation's largest biodigester facility and the three eco-districts we have, which Hannah, Hannah will explain on following. These are examples of sustainable development investment. Managing these trends of consumption and growth correctly is a challenge that we must not fail to meet. Yet, it is a great opportunity for growth in business and the social impact we can have going forward. It is simply a question of planting the seed for a smart and efficient system which holistically takes into consideration the issues surrounding global consumption and waste. We should strive to provide a multifaceted system that includes various renewable sources of energy and seeks to maximize the efficiency within an inefficient field. Even micro-level projects such as digesters in Nairobi at this village level can set a regional and global precedent that frames the mentality of diverse and like-minded individuals just like we see today here at this conference. Like my cousin, I think that we all contain childlike characteristics. We can be impatient at times simply because we're unhappy with the status quo. We may dream too much, but only because we wish to see our communities grow. It's important to remember that the future is not some place we can go. Instead, it is a place that we create. Thank you very much.
Excellent. I'd like to introduce our last millennial, Hannah Clark with Linnaean Solutions. Uh, and she's going to, like I said in the beginning, sort of weave these two together. Michael planted the seed. Hannah. Thank you and welcome to everyone. Um, I hope you're all having a great morning. Um, so yes, so I have the very lofty task of weaving this together and we will see if I do it so you can all let me know. Um, but I do just want to say that I have this kind of systems thinking at the district scale, which is a little bit of a dry title, but I think that Chris and Michael both really illustrated a lot of what this actually means. And for me, I work on an eco-district program, which I'll get into in a few slides, but it's really about thinking about how we can integrate infrastructure, but also build community, community resiliency, and community identity. And I think both of what we've heard from from Chris, from really creating a community around organic recycling, showcasing how the power of bikes, the power of working together can really achieve this sustainable waste system in a city. And Michael, with looking at not only infrastructure, but infrastructure is a huge part of how we are going to really achieve our next step and our next uh, sustainable city. So just a bit of background on me. Um, I am a master's of city planning. I'm an urban planner. Got that from UC Berkeley in May 2014. Currently, I'm um, a project man manager at Linnaean Solutions. I work on multifamily resiliency, um, or resiliency and multifamily affordable housing, and the Kendall Square Eco District. Both things that don't contain the words organic recycling. But um, I am hoping to make that connection and really demonstrate um, what I see and what we all see as. Um, the path to the future and how we can all work together to achieve these sustainable cities. And previously, I was a bureaucrat. I worked for the city of Philadelphia, city of Boston, and during grad school, worked for the city and county of San Francisco. So I'm jumping into the private sector in this new job. However, most importantly, as I think probably a lot of you may know, I'm Nora's daughter. <laughs> and not, I just wanted to throw this in there as a disclaimer, but um, Honestly, I am incredibly lucky. I grew up surrounded by incredible thinkers, incredible doers. Um, my entire family, you know, starting with my grandfather, really inspired me to start thinking about, first, you know, I was out there with my mom composting, collecting kitchen scraps, and then I got to college and found that I really was into watersheds and green infrastructure, and then planning hit, and I saw how this could all kind of come together in a sustainable city planning. And I think it really, you know, something that I discovered later on when I was in college that my grandfather authored this book called The New Food Chain in 1978. And it's making the link between the farm and the city and saying how can we take what we're the waste we're producing on the farm and power the cities and where does the food come from? How can we think locally and how can we have this closed loop, loop system that really is so was so ahead of its time. I mean we're all trying, at least for me, I, that's what I'm trying to do in the work that I'm talking about when I work with the stakeholders in the eco district in Cambridge. We're trying to think within how can we recycle the materials and how can we use the waste we produce to create something great in this neighborhood. And I just want to quickly also mention here before I get into the project that I know we've been talking a lot about cities and being a daughter of BioCycle, I know a lot of you don't necessarily always work in cities. And I think though that this being the millennial panel, we're mainly going to be living in cities. And a lot of us aren't going to own a car and a lot of us are thinking about how we can function and how we can build upon all the great work that you're doing in an urban setting. And so I think there's such an important link, as my grandfather made in 1978, between what's going on in rural or more less urban areas and what happens in the city. And I don't think we should forget that. And we should definitely all work together to collaborate. So I work on an eco-district program um, in Kendall Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I just wanted to very quickly, um, eco-district is a big topic. It's something that came out of Portland, Oregon. Um, so all of you who go to the Portland conference can go check them out. There's five of them there. Um, but it's basically a sustainable development strategy. It looks at the neighborhood or district scale, and it's really about resiliency, performance, and reduced environmental impact, but both through infrastructure systems, so energy, water, waste, and then a community identity, and building up a public realm that can really facilitate that interaction and strength that will ultimately 
cause the success of these integrated infrastructure systems. So why eco-districts? This is a long quote. I won't read it to you, and I'm happy to share this PowerPoint if anyone wants to learn more. But um, basically, um, eco-districts thinks beyond the building scale. You can think of the city block. You can think of the neighborhood. And it's about saying, we're only really going to achieve those great efficiencies especially in infrastructure, if we think beyond buildings, if we think about how we can share energy loads, how we can combine our waste to power our buildings, um, how we can recycle water so we can lessen our impacts on in terms of stormwater and water use, while all kind of building a culture around community resiliency and a sustainable public realm. So I'm having this play out in Kendall Square, as I mentioned, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In Kendall Square, I mean, I'm talking about community resiliency and these kind of, you know, the great things that Chris is doing. And Kendall doesn't really have that. It's basically this huge conglomeration of office parks. It's full of innovation. It's full of biotech. It has the big kahunas like Google and Facebook and Twitter. And it has MIT, so all these really smart kids are coming and then they're working in the big kahunas and it's like, Wild, but um, is there a commitment to sustainability here? And right now, what I'm working on with a group of about 11 companies, um, institutions, and nonprofits in the area, um, is can we create a vision for a sustainable Kendall Square? Can we find these integrated infrastructure connections? And we're just at the beginning stages, so I'm here to kind of tell you about the opportunities we're starting to identify, and how that kind of links into some of what we were talking about today, and then hopefully invite you to engage with an eco-district that might be in your part of the country because there are actually quite a few popping up. So Kendall Square is, as one of our stakeholders likes to say, the densest square mile of innovation in the world. <laughs> and so that's a very you know, self-congratulating <laughs> perspective. Um, but there is, there's a lot of development, there's a lot of money, I mean, you can imagine we're building, they're really huge lab spaces, huge office spaces, some luxury residential. Um, something else, there's multiple cogen facilities. So cogeneration, because of the high energy needs of this area, they use, Kendall Square as a whole uses one third of all the energy in Cambridge. So, and because they have these such intensive um, production and office spaces, they need a reliable source of energy. So places, certain labs have created their own cogen. There's a Veolia cogen plant there, and there's also MIT's cogen plant. There's Brain, MIT, and you know all these other amazing international companies are locating there. And something else that I will you'll see in my next slide, there's river access. There's really great physical location. And so Kendall Square is overflowing with opportunity. It's overflowing with ways that we can start making these connections. And what that's what we're trying to do with this group. So Kendall Square faces some district level problems. And I think in this, I really wanted to kind of emphasize that from these district level problems that can't be solved on a site by site basis, or even if you tried to, it would just almost be kind of futile, beca futile because it's just very, hard to think about managing stormwater building by building, even though that is how we think. But eco-districts, it's about looking at an integrated system. So um, the first photo is at Draper Labs, one of our stakeholders. They, this is stormwater flooding, um, which is very typical. This area has a very high water table. It has a lot of impervious surfaces. And so if we can think about district scale solutions between all our different areas and within the Kendall Square eco-district, how can we manage the stormwater? How can we keep it, you know, do keep some of it on site? How can we maybe put it into a recycled water facility? So we're starting to think, how can we use compost to amend our soils and really increase the performance of our open spaces? Our energy infrastructure is close to capacity in Kendall Square. As I said, they use a ton of energy. And Cambridge just passed a net zero carbon ordinance. So they have to be thinking about net zero. and. Where better to think about getting energy than from our waste? And this area does have a fairly large waste stream. And we are thinking about things like anaerobic digestion and if that could be located. I mean, with an innovative hub, why not leverage these types of, you know, great energy innovations that are coming out of your industry? And finally, transportation. Our, the transportation system in general is incredibly taxed. And I mean, we're just kind of hitting the tip of the iceberg on a lot of these, but 
something that is very um, important to our stakeholders is really thinking about um, leveraging contracts so they can carry waste um, together rather than um, have all these individual truck trips. So now I just wanted to invite you to, as I gave my brief spiel on why eco districts are so great and how they relate to everything that you're doing. Um, hopefully that was somewhat clear. Um, but there is, we're part of a Target Cities program through ecodistricts.org, and so there are actually eco districts that are working on a lot of the questions that I just outlined and are thinking about obviously the materials management side, obviously those connections between building community, how can we do programs like community compost, and how can we think about waste and energy in a really productive way. So if you're from any of these cities, if you want more information, I'm more than happy to provide it. Um, I think there's a great opportunity to think at the district scale and get our cities on the right path for sustainability. So thank you so much. You can see where the inspiration came across the board because we had had the opportunity to, you know, when I sat and listened to Chris's presentation in January, it's like I just ran up to him after because this is really where things are starting and what Michael and, and Jim are doing with biogas researchers and, and fleets and, and Hannah, I sort of was tracking her a little more closely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all. That was fabulous. to hit the little projector. Projector. Um, we are going to close our opening plenary with um, Bob Sum Robert Summers, uh, who is Secretary of the Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, he, B Bob Robert Summers is a PhD, was appointed Secretary of the Maryland Department of the Environment in April 2011. Uh, he leads the department in its efforts to protect and restore the quality of Maryland's air, water, and land resources while fostering smart growth, a thriving and sustainable economy, and healthy communities. We're uh, excited you can be with us today, and I just wanted to, because I forgot to do it with um, with Sean to thank both of you for your sponsorship and work. Uh, your, we work very closely with your staffs and just really a wonderful collaboration. So with that, I'm going to thank welcome. You. Thank, thank you. you. Well, it's uh, it's an honor to be here following uh, the three of you. Um, sometimes uh, being in uh, charge of a regulatory agency, all I hear are the problems and the issues uh, uh, and the struggles, but uh, it's terrific to hear um, your vision uh, for the future. And um, probably uh, this uh, talk should be given uh, by uh, the young professional on our staff who has really spearheaded uh, our efforts uh, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to hear from her uh, later on in the conference. She'll be speaking, Kaylee Lalliker. So um, I'm going to talk about organic uh, recycling trends in Maryland, but uh, the uh, first slide, I think the first slide kind of goes back to the talk we just heard here. Um, why are we doing this? Well, it's part of an overall system. Uh, we need to address greenhouse gas uh, emission across our state, and we have a very aggressive greenhouse gas reduction plan, and uh, a big part of that is zero waste strategy, which is an aspirational goal and uh, has a big uh, organics recycling component to it. But not only is it a greenhouse gas issue uh, and an air pollution issue, we have some of the worst air quality here in Maryland, uh, 
in the eastern end of the U.S. Uh, at the nation's tailpipe, as we like to say sometimes. Uh, it also improves the health of Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Chesapeake Bay is highly eutrophic, too many nutrients coming this way. Uh, we ship grain in from the Midwest and we feed it to chickens and uh, the litter uh, is uh, used uh, on the soil in the state, uh, often at rates that are too high. And so this is a big issue for restoring Chesapeake Bay and our water quality. And uh, it also is a tremendous asset for sustainable agriculture in creating uh, the value from uh, ag feedstocks. So a uh, very important part of our system. Uh, Maryland is a heavily developed state, so we have a lot of lawns out there. Actually, uh, unfortunately, turf grass, I think, is either the number one or number two crop in Maryland after corn. So uh, it's, uh, it's a big factor. So obviously, a lot of yard trimmings. Uh, we do a pretty good job of recycling those because uh, it is required uh, that it be done. Um, but uh, food scraps, uh, we're not doing so well. And uh, so we really need to get more into uh, food uh, recycling. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is a big challenge. So right now, um, we generate about 166,000 tons of sewage sludge. Uh, which is land applied across Maryland. A lot of folks who are moving out into suburban sprawl land next to the farms don't like this stuff. Uh, but obviously it's, it's very important that uh, we do a good job uh, recycling uh, that. Um, and uh, a lot of our farms obviously are producing uh, manure, uh, animal mortalities, and other things that need uh, to be composted, and um, we uh, have in Maryland, I already mentioned our chickens, but we also have more horses per square mile than any other state, uh, according to uh, the stats I have here. So where are we with this? Uh, you can see compostables uh, at the bottom uh, of this chart here. Uh, make up uh, a large part of our of our waste stream, um, and uh, and and a lot a large part of what is uh, recycled. I'm sorry, this is showing uh, the portion uh, that's recycled of, of our total recycling, and uh, we uh, food scraps, yard uh, trimmings make up almost a third of all the uh, uh, tons uh, recycled. Um, most of that, obviously, uh, yard waste. How do we do uh, compared to the rest of the country? Uh, you can see uh, Maryland is down on the uh, sloping part of uh, the graph there in green, probably not that visible from the back. But uh, we're, um, let's see, seventh, I guess, overall in 33 states in terms of tonnage. But uh, when you look at this on a per capita basis, uh, we're ranking third uh, behind Iowa and Washington. And since there may be some folks from California here, just point out California's got a, a big number, but remember they've got a lot of people too. So um, in any case, um, we have a, a big focus on um, composting and increasing composting in Maryland. And uh, we, in 2012, our legislature uh, required our department to put together a work group and um, to uh, come up with things that uh, we need to do to get more uh, composting done in Maryland. Things like educating the public on the benefits, um, supporting markets for finished compost, and establishing a clear regulatory pathway for new and expanding uh, composting facilities. And uh, in 2013, uh, we actually were able to get a portion of the law changed to allow us to modify 
our regulations to try to facilitate composting, and, and this has been uh, a very uh, complicated process trying to satisfy all the different parties, but uh, uh, composting can be uh, an environmental hazard if it's not done properly. So uh, a lot of uh, effort uh, went in, has gone into that, and those regulations are uh, ready to come out uh, shortly for formal public review and comment. Um, I mentioned our zero waste plan. It's a critical part of our greenhouse gas reduction strategy in Maryland, and uh, we have set long-range goals, so you all uh, and your kids are going to have to follow through on all of this stuff that we've been talking about uh, in order to actually reach these kinds of numbers, but uh, you'll be interested to see we set a goal of 90% for food uh, recycling, so uh, we need your uh, your type of uh, project in Baltimore, which uh, recently is reported in The Sun, which is our local paper, uh, the fourth most rapidly growing city in terms of uh, folks in your age category. So one day maybe we can see Baltimore on your list there uh, that you just showed. So it's uh, very important that we increase our capacity for dealing with food waste, and we've got a couple of uh, facilities that have been started up in the last year or so in Maryland, one in this county, Howard, and one in Prince George's. Uh, we need to scale these up a lot more, and the new regulations uh, should help us do that. And then uh, we've got to uh, try to get folks to do this, not just at home, but in uh, the various office buildings, and our department has piloted uh, a food scrap uh, collection program, and we've actually, uh, last year, collected 79 tons of uh, food waste just in our office, people uh, bringing uh, lunch in, and that's, uh, our office is about, uh, I guess, 700 folks, so um, it's been very popular, and. Uh, uh, we're trying to use it as an example for other state agencies. Our University of Maryland College Park, which is a very large college campus, I think 35, 40,000 students, has uh, green dining uh, where they recycle food waste and, and other things. And um, so we need to do more of this. And then uh, in our agricultural community, this is a, a picture of uh, the uh, anaerobic digester in Cecil County uh, that's owned and, and operated by uh, Bill Kilby. And uh, I see he will be speaking later today or tomorrow in the conference. And uh, if it's a good field trip if for no other reason he produces some of the best ice cream in the state. So, um, oh, oh, I hear we're going to be tasting there. Kilby ice cream at the ice cream social today, so uh, be sure and uh, check that out. Some of the waste is under that, uh, that dome there. And then uh, increasing compost use. Uh, you've got to have end products for the use of this material, and uh, we have a law in 2010 that uh, has state agencies giving preference to the use of compost and maintaining public land. Uh, we establish compost and compost-based products uh, in highway projects as a best management practice for erosion and sediment control and post-construction stormwater management. And our local governments, many of them are now ramping up very uh, aggressive stormwater control programs. And Montgomery County is kind of out in front of everybody because they got their uh, MS4 permit a little sooner than some of the others, but uh, they have this Rainscapes uh, reward program, which uh, encourages the use of composting in a lot of the green uh, stormwater practices. So back to the systems approach that we just heard about, uh, absolutely critical. Sustainability, obviously jobs uh, are absolutely critical, and uh, this is just uh, stats from uh, an article
article done by uh, Platt and others called Pay Dirt and uh, Composting in Maryland to Reduce Waste, Create Jobs, and Protect the Bay. So uh, it, is, uh, it is a factor uh, also in uh, the growing green economy. So uh, our next steps, uh, we got to finalize these regulations and get more composting facilities in place in Maryland, enhance the uh, infrastructure for processing food waste, increase public awareness, support the compost markets, and uh, also uh, do more anaerobic uh, digestion and, and other uh, technologies for organics recycling. So uh, we've got a lot of work uh, cut out for us, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody and uh, to hear some encouraging words from the other members of the panel. So thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, so much to, to all of our opening uh, speakers this morning. I did just came together so well, so really excited, a great start. I just wanted to mention that in your bags you have a copy of the September issue of BioCycle. Uh, it's a great issue filled with uh, articles based on presentations you're going to hear here or the tours we're going to be taking. So I encourage you all to, to have a look through that uh, when you get a chance. We're going to uh, go into a, a uh, refreshment break in the exhibit area in the grand ballroom and the uh, the uh, uh, other lobby area and reconvene at 11 o'clock in our breakout session. So thank you very much and thank you again.
do what you got to okay. do. I'm going to okay. take this. Right. Until, until I leave this. Um, I think you're good taking it. Huh. If you need to switch back, I'll be here. Okay. Okay.